I mean, I've seen from the clerk of those kind of three Exactly. Thank you. Um, so before I start talking about non-destructive testing, I want to thank the organizers for this great opportunity to talk here at this very nice conference. Uh, I also want to mention, especially because it's not very well readable, uh, the help I got from Gart Wells, Marie Rones, and Patrick Farrell uh, for the work I, I did or will present to you in this talk. So first of all, of course, I have to tell you a few things about non-destructive testing. Um, I want particularly to go into what so well demanding for my problem. And then I'm going to go a bit into the core of Phoenix, talk a little bit about solving my problem. And a few adjustments, may, maybe a plus plus is exaggerating, but I made a few small adjustments to the code in um, Phoenix and also in Dolphin and Joint. And then I'm going to present one uh, result in non-destructive testing to come to conclu conclusion, but mainly uh, a large outlook. Right, so non-destructive testing. I've put this object here. It's a plexiglass cube, three by three centimeters in every direction. There's a transducer on it, so this thing emits a signal. It creates a wave. Um, and then with this thing, it's a vibrometer, we can measure um, very, very small displacements on the boundaries of this object. Now, what do we want to do? Well, we want to test this object um, to see whether or not it is intact. How long will it last in the end? Um, so there's, there's four levels. The first level is, so what, what are the material properties of the object in general? And then maybe you want to know whether or not there are defects inside your object. If there is a defect, you want to know the properties of the defect, shape, orientation, size, and so on. And once you know the, uh, the properties of your defect, then you want to know how long will my object last for whatever it has to do. Um, so there are several ways to do this. First thing that might pop in mind is doing MRIs. It's quite expensive. It's not that easy to do for solid objects. And so I'm using uh, ultrasound, basically, so wave propagation problems to, uh, to attack this problem. And actually, I'm doing um, all kinds of wave propagation problems, acoustics, electromagnetics, and elastodynamics. And my angle is to do automated non-destructive testing. So there are a lot of techniques experimentally that work quite well, quite fast, but it requires a lot of experience and a proprietary knowledge to execute that. So I want to do it in an automated way. I want to look for really small defects. And my defects are not just air bubbles, but I want to look at nonlinear defects like cracks and that can even open and close so that have a memory uh, hysteresis and so on. And those things have consequences. So first of all, my uh, way of doing this uh, non-destructive testing in an automated way is by solving inverse problems. Now, since I have a PDE, I'm doing PDE constraint optimization. And um, since I want to go to a lot of parameters, I'm using adjoint techniques to solve my problem. Then micro defects. If you want to look for really small defects, you need really small wavelengths. Small wavelengths come for, with waves with a high frequency. And if you have small wavelengths, you need sufficient cells per wavelength in order to not have dissipation of energy in your system. So I need dense meshes. Then I have defects with discontinuous properties. So those are nonlinear. And I'm choosing to solve my system with DG because of these discontinuities why not use a discretization method that allows modeling discontinuities uh, inherently? Now, since I have nonlinearities, I have to solve in time domain since I'm using discontinuous Galerkin uh, methods, um, which is an explicit discretization technique. I have to do explicit time stepping. Because I'm doing time stepping and I have dense meshes, there's this thing called CFL uh, condition that requires me to use very small time steps. So I have to do a lot of them because it takes some time before the wave I emit receives at a point where I can receive it. So I have to do a lot of time steps. And that, in its turn, um, requires many flops. But because I'm solving inverse problems, I also have to store, well, preferably store, intermediate solutions. So I have uh, large memory requirements and I have to do many uh, flops. And those two things together make it a quite computationally demanding problem. It's not really difficult, it's just computationally demanding. 
Right, so before I can tackle the inverse problem, I have to solve my forward problem. So this is the system I'm solving. Um, so it's um, a system that represents an elastodynamic wave uh, equation. So there is this uh, stress, uh, compliance tensor, we have particle velocities, mass density. Um, I use a system, so uh, a mixed formulation, so you can also write it down as a second order equation. I use the mixed uh, system because I want to later on use um, PMLs, perfectly matched layers for truncating infinite domains or just large domains I want to reduce uh, for simulation purposes. So um, that's the reason why I'm using this uh, system. Okay, and I'm using discontinuous Galerkin, as I mentioned before, and that means that uh, when I want to solve my system, the linear system I have to solve is block diagonal. So I have uh, blocks on the diagonal, and those matrices are proportional to each other, just, well, so if you use a mesh with uh, the same kind of element, so same order, same uh, size, so let's say tetrahedrons, um, then they're proportional to each other just with uh, um, the varying factor is their volume. So we want to exploit this structure, and up until a few versions of Phoenix ago, that was not yet possible. You could use the LU solver, and you could guess it does quite well, but let's try and exploit this structure. So uh, together with Guard, we um, uh, enhanced the existing local solver to really solve this problem and exploit the block diagonal structure by just storing the blocks and use then dense linear uh, algebra packet, package to solve those local systems. Um, then, of course, we can factorize the blocks just once and store the factorizations and reuse them. But since the blocks are proportional to each other in most simple cases, uh, you can just factorize one block and do the updates after solving the system. Um, and then there's a fourth thing you can do is use, uh, instead of quadrature, you can use tensor representation for assembly, but there's a small problem for that uh, I'll talk later on about. So I want to do some timings to see whether or not these things helped. And for that, I'm to uh, I, I define a small problem. So I have a unit cube. In the middle of the cube, I'm, uh, I have an initial value, which is a Gaussian pulse. So if I do that in 2D, the Gaussian pulse goes in all directions, but in elastodynamics you have more uh, wave speeds, so in different directions you have different wave speeds. So the wave front looks like that and not circular as you would expect in fluid dynamics. Um, so, and I'm using, uh, so there are 12 cells in every direction and every cube cell is divided in six, six uh, tetrahedra. Um, okay, so let's go to the timings. First thing we do is we use the LU uh, solver. So obviously the numbers I'm presenting are relative. Um, I don't have a fancy machine to do all these uh, computations. So, and then I vary the order of the finite elements, the discontinuous elements I'm using. So first order takes about 200 seconds. And then we increase the order and we see, well, for second order, third order, we have quite a nice speed up, so it's worthwhile doing that. But apparently going to higher orders doesn't pay off anymore for some reason. Now this is the default LU solver. Um, I wanted to compare with MUMS. Um, for some problems it's better, but not for this one. Certainly not um, if you do it sequentially, so just on one core. But if you go to parallel, MUM catches up. So it does more or less the same as the default LU solver in parallel. In parallel, I just have four cores on my computer, so I saved one to do some browsing. Uh, and uh, I use three cores for the computation. So it's not really massively parallel, but still MUMS picks up where you expect it. So it runs better in parallel. Right, so time to compare with the local solver. This is our local solver. And, well, it does a lot worse uh, than the LU um, problem. Well, it's not exactly fair because LU uh, reuses the factorization um, already, not this one. So let's compare with the results where we do store the factorization. And we see that, well, it does a little bit worse for third order elements, a little bit better, but I guess that neg negligible. Um, and if we store and factorize only one matrix and then do the updates were a little bit better, but that's not really significant. So, well, we invested quite some time um, and we didn't really gain something from it. 
But then when we go to parallel, remember only three cores, so that's quite a big setup cost to go to parallel. And then we see that going for LU from one to three cores, there's not even a factor of two gain. But for the local solver, you start to reach the factor of three already. So just for that few cores, you already have more or less the speed up you would expect by going to multiple cores. So it scales a lot better. So if we compare LU, in the best case, with third order elements, and um, the local solver where we factorize one matrix and store it and reuse it, we already have a 30% speed up on just three cores. So that's already worth something. Now, what would happen if we use uh, the tensor representation for assembly, which is not possible because it cannot handle facet normals, which I need for my discontinuous Galerkin uh, formulation. So I just left out all the facet normal terms and did the computations anyway, so there's probably rubbish that came out of it. <coughs> but I just wanted to see whether I should invest some time in trying to make the facet normals run for tensor uh, representation. And then what you see is that uh, if you, you put it all together, so it's third order, local solver, storing one matrix, uh, factorizing, doing the updates, there is still quite a nice gain to get to go from uh, quadrature to tensor representation. So I'm inclined to invest some time in that. I sent an email to the mailing list. I got a few hints from uh, Anders to how to get started on this, so I uh, might do it. Um, okay, so but I, I did got a, I, I know what the best, let's say, parameters are to solve my forward problem, so that's already quite a nice benefit because I have to solve my forward problem several times to solve my inverse problem. So now I can go to my inverse problem and I'm starting easy, I'm not yet looking to defects. Uh, wave speed, so as you remember the elliptical wavefront, there are two wave speeds in the most simple case. In the most difficult case, you can have up to nine wave uh, speeds. Um, so I just want to characterize those. I have a reference, uh, V star, so the, the perpendicular displacements on, the, on my cube, uh, which I measure, measure at one specific receiver, R. And I have the computations. So I want to minimize the difference between what I measured and what I've computed with my forward system I already mentioned beforehand. Now, there's one problem in Dolphin Adjoint. There's more than one problem, is that what you said? <laughs> um, okay, so you have to write your objective functional uh, in UFL. And since I want to evaluate somehow in one specific point, that's not yet possible. So I cannot um, write a functional this way. So I'm working on a new kind of functional. I, for the moment, call it a local functional, where you can just give your solution give your reference solution on your receiver position, say where your receiver position is, then the times at which you measured your reference, so that you can also choose how, how many you want to use, and then this last is just the index because I'm using a tensorial uh, unknown field. I only can use the perpendicular uh, position, measure the perpendicular position, so I have to indicate which one uh, I want to use. So there's quite some challenges in there, like making it work not only on nodes, but also at random positions on the mesh, so that the user doesn't have to look for that, uh, especially. Maybe you can do multiple measurements, so you have multiple receivers, but you all want to squeeze them in your same objective functional to get better results. So all those things more or less work in separate uh, branches, so I have to merge them. So, But if you're interested, please let me know, and I'm happy to share this. Uh, functional with you. Right, so I made my few uh, adjustments to Phoenix and Dolphin Adjoint, and that brings me already to one of my results. So I have this cube I modeled, so I showed you the picture in the beginning. I have the transducer that emits the wave. I'm receiving a signal at the bottom. At this moment, I'm using a simulator reference. So I just solved my forward problem, pretended I measured, and um, check what, what happens. Um, and so I start with a distortion of 1% for one velocity and more than 3% for the other one and just let Dolphin adjoint do the work. Well, I think most of the work is done by the SciPy optimizer. Um, but in the end, it all comes out very nicely. I will mention that I added some Gaussian noise, uh, noise so not to commit a, an inverse crime. 
Um, so it's not, uh, so it, it looks quite nice um, in that case. Of course, that's not where we want to finish. It's quite a simple problem. So we want to go to a measured reference. And there's quite some additional challenges there because, um, so I, I, I'm, this is the same picture from beforehand, but now you can see where exactly the vibrometer is measuring. And now it, you can see I picked a spot more or less immediately next to my uh, transmitter. And that's to reduce the amount of time steps I have to make. And that means also the amount of time steps I have to store to, do the, uh, to solve my inverse problem and to evaluate my functional. Um, because it still requires, well, quite a lot of time. So I have to do a lot of forward solve. That way, I can also ignore the boundary conditions and so on. So it helps me uh, to get there. Um, but it's still work in progress. So I would really like the factor to speed up from using the tensor representation uh, before I can do more elaborate uh, experiments on that. Uh, so I will not show you plots, but they're not all bad. So. Um, so then I guess that already brings me to my summary. So uh, there's a local solver. It's available in, in the, last, the latest Phoenix versions already. Uh, so you can use it. Just give it your um, variational forms. Um, and then you can use it to solve DG systems. So there's a gain, uh, especially uh, if you run it in parallel, even on a few cores you get really the gain from using more cores. Um, Dolphin and Joint can use this local solver. So that was also not possible beforehand. It's a small hack, but still. Uh, and then you have this local functional you can use to have functionals on specific spaces or places uh, at the boundary. So then my outlook, which is, well, still a lot of things to do. So first of all, well, I'm, I'm Still wondering whether I want to uh, add this facet normal to the tensor representation. Um, we'll see whether uh, it cools down enough to uh, think about that. Um, I want to improve my results with a measured reference. Uh, if my uh, forward problem gets solved fast enough, then that should not be a big problem. Um, then I want to use uh, truncation techniques to solve bigger domains. So where we just take part of a larger domain and solve on that one. So that's work I've already done to uh, uh, automatically calibrate um, truncation techniques, truncating regions. Uh, so that's work that's already been done, also with Dolphin and Joint. Uh, of course, I need to do it on some irregular domains. Otherwise, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to use unstructured meshes. Um, and then I need to go to a nonlinear defect, probably delamination. So that's a crack that can open and close. Uh, it has a memory. It it's, um, uses different forces to open and close. This is quite uh, a big step again. And then I want to, well, use it on a relevant uh, example, so not a stupid cube. But that's, the, let's say, the, the target I set for myself. If I can solve it on a small cube on my own computer, then it's worth going to a supercomputer for, let's say, parts of an airplane. It does make sense if I cannot solve my cube on my computer. If I have to use a supercomputer already for that one, no one will ever use the method for uh, a real problem. So that's the objective. And I have a good feeling I will get there. So um, yeah, that was my talk. Uh, so thanks a lot for your attention. You should be going. So, yeah. so, do you have a model for how fast you think you should be going? Because it seems to me it's, it ought to be reasonably straightforward to construct one. I mean, you're reading a vector, you know how many faults you have to do to do the inverse, you just bandwidth. Right, right. So, the question is whether I check if I spend time in the right places, something like that. Where, where's their memory? Well, time leaks. Uh, well, so, it, it's hard to see. Between a what? Yeah. 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 Okay. 
so that, that's one comment I, I mentioned, I forgot to mention. So as I increase the uh, degree, I reduce the amount of elements. So the amount of nodes more or less stay the same, but I guess you got that part. Okay, but yeah, you're right. So these are quite stupid timings, um, but it tells me already something where or not it's worth investing some more time in, in doing it. So um, I, I, in the end, I want to solve my application. Uh, I, I don't want to spend another year in having an optimal DG solver in Phoenix. Um, Rob? Right, that, that, that would have been fair. No, I did not do that. So obviously I will not get the entire speed up, but I guess there's still something to gain there. Right, because I mean, it's not clear to me, I mean, there's I, I didn't, cross edges Yeah, but I didn't leave out um, all the interior uh, facet terms. So some terms don't require facet normals, and those are still in there. So it's just part of those terms. So for the assembly, I don't think, if you leave out the terms entirely, it makes a big difference. So, um, so there, yeah, so, so there's, only, there's only just the jump terms. Yes, exactly. It's, yeah, so it's not clear how expensive I, I know. those are, but yeah. I know, it's, it's, it's cheating. It's still be a save, savings in tensor mode, but yeah. there's also a lot of upkeeping on those terms. Yeah. Yes, dude. I, I, I don't really care about the order I'm using. I just want the one that goes fastest. So the low order scheme, you might be able to um, forego doing the RPDG and do one of the other time-stepping things that you can save to help. Yeah. But in the end, if, if you solve inverse problems, you're not really um, concerned about the accuracy of your results. So you try to stay low uh, uh, order of accuracy in your time stepping, so it doesn't really make sense to go to really high order for DG. Yeah, that's true. But it's worth playing around with time integrators. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, Um, so, how do I handle um, the G meshes for the local uh, functional? Well, um, so if, if you just write it down on paper, what your derivative should look like of your functional, it's basically evaluating your um, basis elements at certain nodes, and it, it's not really a big difference whether, wh what kind of elements you have. So, I, I tried. Yeah. If you, if you're on a node, it's quite easy to do. If you're, if you're on a node in a DG space, the function is not defined. Right. So I'll have to look into that more. But I, I did uh, so I, I did checks in one D because there you can um, uh, evaluate on um, on a node at the end. A node is a facet in one D. So there you can use yes, and there everything worked fine. And then you so I, I have to look more in the mat, I agree, but even in one D, if you're evaluating at the jump, yes. there's no well defined single bag. You just took an average or something. Okay. Okay, we'll make it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Yes, thanks.